God bless you today, for today is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 30, Expository Study Bible, so the notes included. And as always, we ask God in the mighty name of Jesus to please bless us with the revelation of this word so we can grow in the knowledge and grace of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. We need the Lord. We need His word. We do. We live in such an evil world. It's just getting more evil every day. And we need Jesus more, more and more and more. Got to have him. Verse 1, the words of Agar, the son of uh, Jekiah, even the prophecy the man spoke until unto uh, Ithiel, even unto Ithiel in Usul. The Jewish Talmud says that Solomon was referred to by several names. Agar being one of them, one of them, that being the case. Uh, Jacob was another name for David. Actually, Ithiel and Yusuf may have been disciples of Agar, Solomon. Surely I am more brutish than any man and am not the understanding of a man. I neither learn wisdom nor have the knowledge of the holy. Solomon did not consider himself special because the wisdom which he had was given to him by God. In verse 2 3, it should be possible for us to see why God loves Solomon so much. The greatest commodity in the halls of heaven is humility. Solomon in these two verses portrays humility seldom seen. This man characterized such in his early years and was blessed by God as few men have ever been blessed. And you want to know what humility gets you? It gets you tremendous, tremendous, tremendous benefits from the Lord. When you're when you're when you have humility, just like when, you know, you have the what a combination you want to talk about living. To live a life where your faith is in Jesus Christ and crucified every single second of the day and night and to do it all with humility. What a life that is a life right there. That's the greatest life. It can't be better than that. But Solomon, because he was so, had such humility, real humility, um, God asked him, what do you want? And he could have said anything. I'll ask you, if God asked you the question, you could have anything you want, what do you want? How many people would say money? How many would say, most people would say, give me money. But Solomon said, give me the wisdom to rule your people. And because of that, God made him the richest man ever. Because he asked for wisdom and he got it. He didn't get, he got God's, he, God gave him some of his wisdom. So Solomon was the wisest man ever to live on planet earth besides Jesus. He was the richest man ever in the history of the world, period. And Solomon had it all. There was nothing you could want that he didn't have. He had the wisdom of the Lord. He was a king. He had the finest materials on planet Earth. He had all the wealth of the earth. He had all of the he had the most beautiful women on earth. I mean, as a man, there's nothing he was in want of. There's nothing more he could have asked of. And at the end of the day, he said, all of it was dung, just poop. Because nothing mattered at the end of the day except for God. That's it. Fear the Lord. So that just goes to tell you. He who has ascended up into heaven or descended, who has gathered the wind in his fist, who has bound the waters in a garment, who has established all the ends of the earth. What is his name and what is his son's name? If I, if you can tell this verse exclaims tremendous knowledge of the holy and yet is not contradiction of verse three. The knowledge that is evidence in this verse is which is phenomenal came through the wisdom given to him by God and not through education and knowledge acquired by the normal means of study. It was a revelation from God. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them who put their trust in him. This tells us that every word in the Bible is ordained and inspired of God. And you, not unto his words, 
that lest he re uh, reprove you and be found a liar. Unfortunately, this is the sin of the church. Many that take away or add to the word of God. Two things I are required of you. Deny me them not before I die. Solomon asked for only two things in life. What would you request if such an opportunity presented itself? That is the question, isn't it? If God asked, what do you want? I'll give you anything. What would you want? Like, just be honest. In all honesty, what would you ask for? Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. In other words, Solomon is saying that everything should be removed from him except the Bible. All else is vanity and lies. And he asked that God would be the dispenser of all that he wanted to have. In other words, he would leave in such hands of the Lord. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. These two requests show not only great wisdom, but also tremendous consecration. You know, that reminds us when when um, this verse, when Paul, so remove far from me vanity and lies, give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with communion for me. You know, it kind of reminds me of when Paul was, was, was saying that give him food, no food. Give him shelter, no shelter. Put him in prison, prison, let him be free. Let him be cold, shivering, or let him be hot. Whatever the situation was, he was content in the Lord in all things. The way he acted, the way he believed, the way he was with the Lord was not affected by the circumstances that he was going through. It didn't matter what it was. So that's what it's really about, isn't it? It doesn't matter. It's all about the Lord. And if 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 you can make that if you can make that true then what a life you can live. Think of it. Think about being so consecrated in the Lord that nothing mattered. Nothing mattered. You Oh, you went homeless? Doesn't matter. The Lord matters. Oh, you, you had no food? Doesn't matter. The Lord matters. Oh, you do have food? Doesn't matter. The Lord matters. All right, now I'm... Oh, 10. Uh, 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 accuse a servant unto his master, lest he curse you, and not be found guilty. One of the reasons that God takes such a dim view of this sin is because there is no defense against a lie. So that's why God can't stand a liar. There is a generation that curses their father, does not bless their mother. Sadly, this percentage generation falls into this category. If one is raised without the influence of the Bible, no less can be expected. There's a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. Filthiness. As well as this characterizes the present generation, it speaks of a present self-righteous church. So righteousness justifies oneself. It is pure in its own eyes, but in reality it's filthy in the sight of God. You know, that, that's a lot of people. They just can't admit they just can't admit their sin. They can't admit sin. Even when they read this word, they'll read something in the word that will reveal their sin and they will be self righteous and deny it. No, that's not the way to go. You don't want nothing to do with self righteousness. Remember, humility. You want to be humble. There is a generation, oh how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. This speaks of a generation that is full of vanity, pride, and insolence. There is a generation whose teeth are as swords and their jaws as knives to devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among them. The Pharisees are described adequately in this verse as they attempted to devour the poor and needy, man from among men. That man was Christ Jesus. There is nothing in the world crueler than a man-made religion. And that is the truth. Man-made religion. That's what religion is, man-made that's what the harlot is. The harlot in the book of Revelation who drinks the blood of the saints is religion. The horse, the horse leech has two daughters crying, give, give. 
There are three things that are never satisfied. Yes, four things say not. It is not enough. This speaks of a generation that never has enough and who will prey on their neighbor to gain even more. Uh, this all sounds so familiar today, doesn't it? Doesn't this all, all sound very familiar for today also? The grave and the barren womb, the earth is not filled with water, and the fire that says not, it is, it is enough. The grave should have been translated hell. This place is never full despite the fact that the majority of the human race has gone there. As well, the barren womb always craves a child. Even as the dry earth longs for water to quench its, its part surface, the fire is also greedy for everything that will burn. So, that's a, that, there's, there's an illustration of hell for you. So, hell is real, ladies and gentlemen. And it is in the middle of this earth. You want to know what's in the middle of this earth? Hell. That's what's in the middle of this earth. And the majority of the people that have been born are in there because they all have rejected God. And everyone is given an opportunity to accept, but tragically, the majority reject. Because at the end of the day, the majority of people believe in self. Me, 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 I, I, I. The eye that mocks at his father and despises to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. The father and the mother spoken of this proverb pertain to those who follow the Bible. If they are mocked and despised, destruction is sure. So you're the parent. You live God's way. The child wants to rebel and despise you and hate you and mock you. God will deal with that. He will deal with that, and it won't be good. Uh, there be three things which are too wonderful for me. Yes, four, which I know not. To show one, one the difference in a man's wisdom and God's wisdom, if man had written such, he would have written about things that he had devised, made it perfected as well. It would have been dated almost by the time the words were written. Conversely, the wonderful things mentioned by the Holy Spirit cease to be no less wonderful now that some 3,000 years ago when this proverb was first written. Yes, the goodness of God is good for infinity. That is a fact. The way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. All four speak of that which leaves no trace of its path. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. The adulterous woman attempts to leave no trace. She claims I have done no wickedness because there seems to be no trace of what she has done. However, the Holy Spirit is saying that even though there may be no uh, discernible trace of where the eagle has flown, still God knows this and also he knows every action of the adulterous woman. For three things, earth is disquieted, and the four which it cannot bear. From the throne to the kitchen, all is unrest and confusion when God is not recognized and served. For a servant, when he reigns, and a fool, when he is filled with meat. For an odious woman, when she is married, and a handmaid that is heir to the mistress. When a servant reigns, he will... He will lord it all over. He will lord it over all who have the misfortune to be his employer kingdom. The fool thinks his stomach is filled because of his great wisdom. The Holy Spirit says that if a woman is odious before marriage, she will so be. She will she be after marriage. The handmaid, as proclaimed here, falls into that same category as a servant. There be four things that which are little upon the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. These things that are mentioned are feeble and defenseless, but because of wisdom, they have food, security, government, and dignity. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. As small as they are, the ant has a systemized government. The Holy Spirit says that men would do well to observe it. So, isn't that, <laughs> isn't that something? So, as God said, look at the little ants. Look at the little ants. There's discipline. There's obedience. There's structure. And observe. 
the conies are a, a, a feeble folk, yet make their houses in the rocks. The conies are so observant, the wary that they are almost impossible to apprehend. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by the bands. There is power and unity, even as the locusts portray. The spire takes hold of it with her hands, and it is the king's palaces. For their size, spires have an amazing ability to fend up fend for themselves. The Holy Spirit implores us to at least use the wisdom given to these little creatures. So, we can see these little, these animals, these little bugs. We can see how they know how to do what they do because God gave it to them. There be three things which go well, yes, four that are comely and going. The four things mentioned are graceful in their actions. A lion, which is strongest among beasts, and turns not away from any. The lion has been called the king of the beasts. He alone is the leader. A greyhound and he go also, and a king against whom there is no rising up. The greyhound runs races and is very graceful in his action. The he go stands at the head, the majestic head of the sheep. A king who deals honestly and correctly with his subjects cannot be toppled. If you lay down foolishly in lifting up yourself, or if you have thought evil, lay your head upon your mouth. Confess your sins unto the Lord who forgives, and not man who will not forgive. Surely the churning of milk brings forth butter, and the rearing of the nose brings forth blood. So the forcing wrath brings forth strife. The forcing of wrath speaks of self-will. If it anger, If it is angry because it has not had its way, Man's way always ends in strife and confusion. God's way always ends in fulfillment, development, rejoicing, righteousness. All right, that's chapter 30 of the book of Proverbs. So, you know, it's going to happen when Jesus comes back. But the life God wants us to have is really a simple life of humility and obedience and following of the Lord doing things his way. So God would have us, he would bless us with the knowledge, of course, but we would build our own shelter. We would plant food. We would farm our own food. And we would spend our days, you know, farming our land and reading the word of God and praying, um, giving the Lord thanks, praise, and worship. And that is what we would do. That would be life. And then whatever God tells us to do on top of that, whatever it may be, but that would be life. Um, a simple shelter. You have your food that you make yourself. And um, that's what it's going to be like. So, you know, this thing of people building homes for people, that's not going to be there. Um, this restaurants and fast food places and such, that's not going to be here. Um, it's going to be stripped down to the simplest things. You're going to build your own, the people are going to build their own shelter. They're going to grow their own food. And once again, God will give the revelation of how to farm and how to build a structure. And they're not, 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 they're not going to be building mansions. They're going to build shelter. There's a big difference between building yourself shelter and building yourself what we know as a home today. Because all that's going to be stripped away. So vanity will be stripped away. Um... Your little flesh will be stripped away. And so, simplest, humblest things. Just a simple shelter that keeps you out of the weather. You know, you go sleep inside, whatever. And you have your land that you farm for your food. And so, very simple life. That's what it's going to be like when Jesus comes back. So, that's what the Word of God says. All right, God bless you.